Uh, so my name is uh, John Masters. I'm a computer architect at Red Hat. Uh, in my normal day-to-day -day job, I'm not mitigating security vulnerabilities. Um, but uh, so, so my my day-to-day -day job is uh, trying to make ARM servers a thing, taking over the world. I work with a lot of the high-performance uh, ARM V8 server companies on their high-performance server designs. And as a consequence of working on that for the past, what, six, seven years, and helping to define the standards for the server SOCs and the firmware and um, everything from interconnects on up, um, I've learned a lot, and others inside the company have learned a lot about um, architecture and microarchitecture. And so what I wanted to do here was first share some thoughts. Not everyone here is a microarchitect, so there will be some introductory material. Um, and then what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about the infamous security vulnerabilities that we can't stop reading about in the, in the media today. I'd like a fairly interactive format here. So you said I could run it however I want. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, if you guys have thoughts, please uh, express yourselves. If we end up in a lengthy tangent, then we'll, we'll come back to it later towards the end. Okay, so I'm going to go through some material on kind of architecture. I'm going to talk about these particular exploits, but as we just alluded in the introduction, uh, there, there are many different kinds of vulnerability out there. In particular, when you let, take a look at any kind of digital system and you think about it outside the box, outside of how it was intended to be used. So the microphone example just now, um, all these devices capturing your, your voice, um, Yes, they can hear your, your secrets, your passwords as you communicate. Um, they've even done analysis reconstructing what you're typing just by feeling the vibrations from your phone being on a table. <laughs> so we'll talk about side channel attacks, but you know, they're not unique to uh, microarchitecture. Uh, you'll, you'll see side channel attacks uh, in many other places in everyday life. Um, and if you want to get hold of me, uh, you can tweet me maybe during the talk. Uh, you can email me, uh, reach me on all the social media. So we're going to talk about uh, Meltdown Inspector. There's the graphic that we have to use. So you guys have seen that. Shall we continue? <laughs> so we'll, we'll cover uh, the difference between architecture and microarchitecture. Uh, we'll talk about in-order uh, and out-of-order execution. We will layer on top of that and talk about speculation and how that works. Some people here. Uh, I'm glad I don't see uh, Hennessy here or anyone who <laughs> would really uh, correct me, but uh, uh, some of you know this far better than I do, and you can feel free to correct anything that you, you think I get wrong. Um, <laughs> we'll, talk about, uh, we'll talk about caches, we'll talk about virtual memory, we'll talk about all the pieces that you need to have some understanding of in order for this to make sense. And then we'll get into branch prediction, speculative execution, uh, these particular exciting vulnerabilities that we've been contending with, uh, and then maybe some, well, it's not so much juicy gossip, but maybe some insights into uh, how we mitigate these when we're confronted with the end of the world being nigh, and what do we do about that? Um, and then we'll talk about some related research, right? Because these are just two of many kinds of, uh, not so novel, but, but uh, uh, kinds of hardware attack. And as, as a software person myself, you know, it's one of the things that maddens me. Someone said, why is the Red Hat guy here, right? So one of the things that maddens me uh, about this industry is that we've gotten into an us versus them over the past few decades. So you're either a software guy or, you're, or girl or you're a hardware guy or girl, and never the two shall meet, right? Um, and I would really like it if we could change that. Pl please. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a personal. Uh, I, I assumed you were a hardware person. <laughs> I, was curious what the role of that I, I have buyer's remorse. I did computer science, and uh, I think if I did my time over again, I may have pursued a different path in my career. I'm not sure if I'd be doing the same talk, but uh, it would have been very interesting. Um, so I find, I find architecture very interesting. I think one of the other things that open source people have found over the past few years of seeing you know, open source architectures like RISC-V and so on, uh, there's, there's a renewed interest in how does it work inside? And as an everyday you know, uh, engineer 
you may not have access to a fab. <laughs> you certainly don't have access to the kind of design tools that you need. But uh, you know, some of us uh, uh, you know, play around pretty seriously with Verilog on the weekend and build some interesting designs. And it's amazing where this is going now. Anyway, let's talk about architecture. So this is a refresher for anyone who's not uh, familiar with the background material. So we're going to talk about the difference between architecture and microarchitecture. So um, computer architectures or instruction set architectures describe the contract that the programmer has with the hardware, right? They describe the primitive operations that the machine uh, can, must support. Um, they include things like you know, loading and storing data from memory, uh, the memory model of the machine, how that works, um, how many registers you have in your machine. Uh, you know, how the stack behaves, how branches and control flow instructions operate, add, subtract, you know, the usual kinds of operations. Uh, they also define uh, separate uh, execution environments. So you have a user or unprivileged or problem state, depending on uh, which architecture you're on and what nomenclature is being used. And then you have a more privileged state uh, that the operating system exists in, right? And People uh, who are not sort of operating system folks tend to think of an OS as always being there, right, running nefariously in the background. But that's not really true. What we do most of the time is try to get out of the way and let the application run, right? And so some of the exploits you're going to hear about, they rely on the fact that we have these optimizations in place that make it really easy uh, to uh, have the OS come in and get out of the way really quickly. Uh, so. You have, the, you have the concept of exception levels or different uh, contexts that the operating system and the application are existing in. And then the operating system has a more privileged state. It has access to uh, some additional registers. It can do a few more things than the application can do. Uh, for example, it can uh, switch out one process for another. It has to change some housekeeping uh, processor registers to do that. Um, and you know, the architecture is the lowest level targeted by an application programmer, um, or these days, more commonly, a compiler you know, or some kind of runtime environment. Right? There are fewer and fewer people actually writing assembly code these days. But if they are, then the architecture specification is what they are targeting. So common concepts in modern architectures. Uh, application programs, when they're running, are known as processes. In Linux, we call them tasks. Um, and then they exist inside this unprivileged exception environment, this unprivileged execution context. They exist inside a virtual memory environment as well. So the memory that an application is using um, is virtual in nature. It's translated from the address the application is using uh, into the underlying address of the physical memory. And that's done through a piece of hardware called the memory management unit. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that's done uh, in a few slides. Um, the point of this is that the operating system provides this illusion of having this flat, contiguous, nice virtual memory. Uh, you know, you're not aware of other programs that are running. You think you got the whole machine to yourself. You can kind of write your program and just you know, have, have all these assumptions that were not true in the early days of computing, for, for sure. And then when the application is running, what it does is periodically it interacts with system software. It interacts with the operating system using something we call system calls. So we have, depending on the architecture, a special instruction that we can, we can use. And we provide uh, some information in some registers that say, I'd like you to do this for me, and then come back. And importantly, towards the bottom of the slide here, uh, in Linux, certainly until recently, <laughs> although we'll come on to why that's changed, uh, in, until fairly recently, the way it worked is um, you had this huge virtual memory space. And so what you did was you had this optimization. You linked your application. Your application used the bottom part of the virtual address space. And your operating system kernel used the top half. And you relied on the standard memory management unit protections to say, if I try to touch some of that memory that's reserved for the OS, uh, I'm going to get an exception. I'm going to get some fault condition. The OS is going to intervene. It's going to say, you can't do that. It's going to kill my program. When we get further down the 
the road towards meltdown, we'll talk about how that's not necessarily true um, and why we had to change that. Okay, so some more concepts. So uh, we, have, we have privileged instructions we can use uh, to manage the environment. I'll talk more about how page tables work and how we do virtual memory translation uh, in a few moments. One of the things that we do whenever we switch from one task to another is we write into a CPU register. On x86, it's called CR3. Uh, on ARM systems, we call it the translation table base register, TTBR. It has different names on different architectures. And you could, you could say that that defines uh, the, mem the context that, uh, that one process is running in. When I write a new set of page tables, I've switched from one program to another. Um, the operating system is responsible for doing that. It does it completely invisibly from the application's point of view. Um, and again, when an application tries to access memory that it doesn't have permission to use, what should happen uh, is a fault should be generated. We call them page faults. Um, this is why, uh, so we use page faults quite extensively in operating systems. Uh, we use them, for example, when you load, when you start running a program, your favorite web browser or whatever you're using, right? It won't actually load the entire contents of that application into memory. What we'll do is we'll start running it. As it starts trying to touch, starts trying to execute its code, we'll trigger page faults, we'll pull more of that application in. The application won't have any awareness that that's going on, right? So page faults are good, they're not a bad thing. We use them all the time. The other way we use them is when we want to page or swap data out to disk. We give this illusion that the machine has more memory than it in fact does because we can, pay, we can temporarily take memory that's in, that's, uh, data that's in memory, we can put it out onto the disk. When the application tries to touch it again, we set it up so that triggers a fault, we go and fix it up, right? These are the common uh, techniques that we use. Examples of architectures, these are just two. Um, you know, you have to give the Intel example, right? Uh, who here has never used an Intel machine? Right, okay. Uh, so, so clearly you have to give x86. I'm a big fan of ARM v8. I could have gone with RISC-V, decided not to. Uh, it's a bit too easy to use that example at this point. But these are examples uh, of two different kinds of architecture. They both do similar things. Um, back in the day, you would certainly define them. We talked earlier about how that's not necessarily true inside, but you would define them in terms of whether one was CISC, one's a complex instruction set architecture, the other one is a reduced instruction set architecture, a RISC architecture, which means the instructions are simpler. Um, and in particular, some of the differences here, on an x86 machine, the instructions are variable size, decoding them is exciting, as we were talking about outside. Uh, you know, I think you can have, they're up to 15 bytes long, and then some of the decoders out there will pull 16 bytes at a time and try to slice and figure out which one goes where, and the decode is crazy on these things, right? But Fundamentally, uh, you know, x86 is variable width, ARM is a fixed width instruction set. They both have registers that they use for their calculations. Uh, in the case of a more complex instruction set like x86, it might be able to directly operate on memory. Uh, in the case of ARM uh, and, and RISC architectures, they're more load store oriented, so you will specifically pull data in to a register and do something with it, and then write the result back. Um, and they're both 64-bit, pretty clean these days. x86 used to have a, a storied history of how it handled memory. Um, hands up here if you enjoy segmentation, right? Okay, so, so but you know, there, it, it wasn't always as clean as it is now. In the 64-bit architecture, AMD 64, when, when AMD ma uh, made the original 64-bit extensions, they kind of killed off a lot of that. There's still some vestigial segmentation. Unfortunately, not enough to get us out of the little problem we'll talk about later. Um, just enough to be there, but not enough to be useful. Uh, you can. I'll, I'll, Would that have solved the problem? Yes. Yes, we'll talk about that a bit later on, actually. For, for, yeah, I don't want to get too far ahead, but uh, you, actually, you actually could, for some 32-bit processors that still have segmentation, we think a mitigation could be to play segmentation register hacks. We can come back to it. Correct. 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 Yes. So we we 
right, and putting that on the stack. We're going to come back to that. Um, OK, so these are two different architectures. Let's talk about microarchitecture. This is when the software guy gets it wrong, right? OK, so before I get in too far into microarchitecture, I want to show you just a, a, a very, very boring diagram that I put together. Uh, you know, modern processors, <laughs> modern chips, right? They're not just a CPU. They're not just processor cores. There's a bunch of extra stuff on there. Uh, most of the ones that we deal with are far more complex than this, but th the key point is they don't just have processors. They also have memory controllers, memory interfaces. They have uh, multiple cores connected together, probably using a high-performance interconnect, one would hope. Uh, <laughs> and they have multiple levels of cache, right? So when I'm operating on data inside uh, a modern processor environment, I've got memory that's pretty far away from my core, and then I've got progressively uh, larger levels of cache as I get further away from uh, the compute core that's doing the work. And as I work on data, what I'm doing is I'm pulling it in through the cache hierarchy. I pull it in through the DDR, through the memory interfaces. It goes into my fairly large last level cache. Might be an L3, might be an L4. Um, and it works its way up to the L1, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Just take away from this that Processors are more than uh, just cores. So the elements of a typical uh, chip today, um, you know, pro programmers think of processors in terms of cores, right? Uh, some of them are multi-threaded. Some of them uh, may actually do very tight resource sharing. Some don't. Um, in the case of very tight resource sharing, then really what you're doing is you're saying, my core is more than one core. I'm going to give you the minimum amount of state to present that as having uh, more than one core. That'll be important for some things we discuss later. Um, the cores are tightly integrated with these interconnection networks. Uh, and we pull data in through the cache hierarchy. I think I've said all that. OK. OK, so the term microarchitecture specifically refers to uh, an implementation of an architecture. Right? So we'll come up with some examples later on. but. You know, you can think of your x86 as being your architecture, and then specific uh, Intel or AMD processors um, are implementations of that architecture. That's microarchitecture. And there are many different kinds of ways to design high-performance processors. Probably more ways to design low-performance processors, I guess, when you think about it. Uh, but at a high level, uh, we can talk about uh, some standard concepts. So you can have in order. Um, implementations in order microarchitectures, which we'll talk about first. Um, and in a way, they're simpler. Certainly, the design is less complex. Um, but there can be benefits to uh, in order designs. Uh, a lot of the folks out there that have in order designs are now saying, we're not vulnerable to some of these exploits. That's great. They're maybe not as performant as some of the others that are vulnerable. Um, but in order designs also can save you a lot of power. So they, they have a lot of benefits. They're heavily used in embedded systems. Um, they're not wrong, they're just different. Uh, and then we also have um, out of order uh, cores, which are designed really to take your in order program, we'll talk more about how this works in a minute, take your in order program uh, and turn it into a data flow machine, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. Uh, so modern processors, as we were discussing outside before, uh, particularly the Intel ones, right? They take these complex instructions, they decode them, they turn them into a risk machine inside, they throw them out of order and run them in whatever order makes sense when, when data becomes available, and then they lie to the programmer and the average software engineer I talk to and you know, talk about out of order machines and data flow machines, they say, what? I, I run the program and it, it, it does stuff and, you know. Precise exception, no, 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 just magic, right? It's, it's, it's magic. Well, let's talk a little bit more about how that magic works. Um, really bad diagrams. Uh, I'm not a graphic artist. The internet has better diagrams. There are whole classes on uh, in-order and out-of-order machines, so we'll go through this pretty quickly. But uh, an in-order core, you know, you can think of your classic uh, risk five-stage pipeline. You fetch instructions, you decode them, you execute them, maybe perform some kind of memory access, and then you commit the results back to a register file, and you rinse and repeat. And you'll see in this diagram that I've got um, 
two different parts of my cache represented here. I've got a level one iCache, instruction cache, from which I'm fetching instructions that I want to execute. And I've got a level one dcache from which I'm fetching data. And then further out, away from the core, you're not seeing that here, I have a unified set of caches beyond that. So when I want to pull something into my level one or my level two cache, it'll actually come from a unified level two and then from level three and level four and so on. Um, why do I split it out? For performance reasons. Partly for area, when you're designing and laying out a chip, uh, you, know, you, you, uh, you, you effectively turn modern machines into these Harvard architectures, separated I and D cache, just because you really can treat the instructions and data separately. Um, that's a classic uh, kind of risk pipeline of the kind that you would see in the computer architecture books, although their diagrams might be better than mine. Um, there's some examples here of how you would decode and execute an instruction, uh, you know, and, and, and how it behaves. I'll let you read that later on. Here's a visualization of how you would have an in-order pipeline. Uh, you can see some parallelism here because uh, in that middle point there, um, I've got this pipeline that's completely filled with instructions at different stages, right? So why do you do this? You do this because uh, you can pipeline processors, you can have them, you can have multiple instructions in flight at different stages in your pipeline. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about what happens if you are uh, executing, putting instructions through your pipeline and one is looking for some data that's not yet ready. We'll talk a little bit more about how how we handle that. I think that's in the next slide. Um, so yeah, so in order microarchitecture, the key sort of downsides to them uh, is that you're, sub you're subject to uh, pipeline stalls. So if I am running a whole bunch of instructions through my different stages of my pipeline, if one of them takes a bit longer, if one of them's waiting for some data to load from memory, my diagram disappeared on that screen, but it's still there, okay. Uh, then, uh, then I may have to insert pipeline bubbles. I may have to just stall the processor and do no useful work. Um, we're limited in our capability to hide the latency of instructions as a result. Let's talk a bit more about out of order cores. Again, it's a bad diagram of mine. What we do with out of order cores is we pull instructions in from our level one instruction cache. Uh, we decode them. And then we have this reorder buffer. I think it's on my next slide here. Yeah, so, okay, well, I'll talk through the diagram. So we pull instructions we want to execute. We have this giant data structure called a reorder buffer. And what we do is we say uh, these later instructions can execute the moment that their data dependencies become available. That's what data flow machines do, right? So we turn our program from being in order, do this and then this and then this, we say, actually, we can get a far more uh, efficient machine if we can look ahead and we can see future instructions uh, could execute the moment that their dependencies become available. Uh, and depending on how big you make these structures, you could actually have quite a large number of instructions that are outstanding. Um, we call this uh, the window size, or different terms are used for this. Um, but on contemporary parts, this could be on the order of 224 instructions, something like this. So it's a reasonable number of um, entries in our, in our reorder buffer. Um, it's common in high performance microprocessors. We also call it uh, dynamic execution. And for those looking for the extra credit question, uh, it was invented by uh, Robert Tomasulo, who uh, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Oh, is it really? Is that, is that? Okay. There was a sex trend. When, when she left IBM, yeah. it was a problem. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go look that up and correct the slide. Um, so uh, Thomas Ulo actually re received a number of awards and I think passed away, what, two years ago? Something like this? A couple of years ago? Um, but, you know, very smart man. I, I do wonder what he would have said uh, about this. Uh, you know, and, and sadly we'll never know. Um, but anyway, I won't, I, won't go, I, I won't go through this line by line. I, I really want you guys to take the slides later and I want you to you know, take anything out of them that's useful. But what, we, what we're doing with out of order machines is um, we're separating our, our, our machine, our, our core, into a front end and a back end, right? We're taking in order 
We're throwing it out there. We're doing it in a different sequence from what the programmer, how the programmer sees the machine. And then we do what we call in-order retirement. So when instructions become the oldest instruction in the machine that's currently got all of its dependencies satisfied, then we say, this instruction is now complete. This instruction retires. We mark it as such in our reorder buffer. And I think I have a slide here. Yeah. Um, we have this concept of uh, having a, an architectural state. So in out-of-order machines, I'll have an architectural register file. This contains my, my kind of committed final state of the machine. I have my out-of-order uh, intermediate state that I'm capturing in my reorder buffer. And when instructions complete, they retire, then I update my architectural register file. And finally, one last thing we can do with out-of-order machines, uh, we can solve some register pressure. When my programmer writes code, they may be constrained to 15 registers, 31 registers, something like this. Some of the calculations they perform, uh, they're reusing a register solely because they have a finite number. Uh, in, the, in the real physical machine, there may be more physical registers. And so I can resolve, uh, you guys probably know all this stuff, but you can resolve you know, hazards by looking at, uh, do I really need this exact register here or will any other register do to satisfy the dependencies for this future instruction? So you can do hazard elimination as well. Um, let's see, so questions you can ask about an architecture. I think I had a couple of examples of architecture here. Yeah, so here's, here's two sort of microarchitectures side by side. This is a fairly, well, it was contemporary <laughs> fairly recently, uh, Intel Skylake. Uh, microarchitecture, which is what's in this laptop. That's why I'm using that example. Um, and then a fairly recent IBM microarchitecture. You can see they've got some similarities. There's some differences. Uh, the IBM machines tend to uh, issue far more instructions per cycle. They're much bigger. Their design point is uh, much higher performance than a, than a laptop part. Um, they've got similar size reorder buffers. IBM calls it a global completion table, but it's basically achieving the same thing. Um, and yeah, I think that's the main stuff I want to point out there. Uh, so when it comes to microarchitecture, we can ask questions about uh, about implementations. Uh, we can see, you know, uh, you, you did an in order design, you did an out of, out of order design. Why did you do this? Well, it's trade off. Um, a uh, an in order design is smaller in terms of area, uses less power. Uh, so you, you see those much more commonly in uh, simpler. Uh, machines. Uh, they can be much less expensive to implement in terms of your engineering team and your validation effort. Uh, you can also ask questions then about, you know, how big is the pipeline? How many instructions can I dispatch? Uh, and then how big is my reorder buffer? How, many, how far ahead in time can I uh, have instructions in flight? These are all kinds of design decisions that you can, you can make, trade-offs. Let's talk about some virtual memory and cache concepts. I said earlier on, virtual memory is what applications see. So in this diagram here, you can see uh, two different processes running, process A and process B. These are potentially two different programs, maybe two instances of the same program, maybe a Bitcoin miner. That apparently is what all machines should be used for today. Uh, well, it's probably a GPU thing, but <laughs> anyway, so uh, you've got two programs running. And the distinguishing piece is the context that they have, right? So they both see different register state. They both see different views of memory. And you've got your physical memory. You've got some kind of translation that happens. Um, and that translation is done by the memory management unit inside the uh, processor using page tables that are managed by the operating system. And the page table management, by the way, doesn't have to be done fully in hardware. You can do it in software. People have done it in software on simpler cores. But for performance reasons, it tends to be a hardware, uh, hardware structures in the chip that read these. And what they'll do is they'll look at the page table and say, you wanted to access this virtual address in your address space. Uh, I'm going to do a translation. I'm first going to check what the page table says uh, in terms of do you have permission to access this address? Can you execute it? Can you read it? You know, there's lots of different piece of data that's contained uh, in the page tables. Uh, and then what will happen, and I think my next slide will point this out, 
what I'll do is I'll cache these translations. So walking page tables is quite expensive. Uh, it can take a lot of different memory accesses because the page tables themselves are contained in memory. Uh, and so I have something called a translation look aside buffer, a TLB, or multiple TLBs that will cache the last few translations. Uh, and you, know, you never have enough TLB entries, but you, know, you usually have room to keep enough of your immediate working set translations inside them so you don't have to go through this expensive lookup every time you do a translation. Uh, so memory addresses are translated possibly multiple times before they reach memory. Uh, so the operating system might do it. If there's a hypervisor, the OS thinks it's the last translation stage. It's actually not. There's a hypervisor underneath it doing that. Could be other stages of translation as well. Uh, if the operating system manages the uh, page tables. The hardware manages the TLBs. And sometimes there's coordination needed there. For example, when I switch from one process to another, I may need to invalidate some of that state. My operating system will say, I want to shoot down the entries there from the last process that was running so that when I go to hex 1000 memory address next time, it's now for a different address space. And we were speaking earlier about some optimizations. I'm going to keep pointing to you because we had a good conversation before. Um, we were talking earlier about how there are some optimizations in modern processors, so I don't have to completely flush every TLB entry when I switch from one process to another. Uh, in particular, ARM has something called ACIDs, address space IDs. x86 has something called PCI IDs, process context IDs. So when I'm running a particular process, I can actually tell the hardware, here's a unique identifier, and it will tag the TLB entries. And so when I switch, when I do a lookup, it can say, well, here's the current value of my address space that I think I'm in, and I'm going to look, that, look up in the TLB, which address space am I in, which address space is that entry in. Uh, you have a question on that? Yeah, so uh, back in the olden days, uh, one of the problems was that sometimes the TLB at 4K pages couldn't even address all of L3 cache. Right. Now you're splitting it. Is that still going to happen? Well, we have larger size than, yeah. yeah. I don't think they're ever big enough. I think that's the short answer for, you know, we, we have a lot of constructs we use in, in software. We have uh, huge pages, gigantic pages, transparent huge pages, lots of different ways that we can underneath say, uh, we're going to actually use a larger TLB entry. We can get to that after, but there, there, there are optimizations you can do. Well, you know, so, so, so okay. Probably not enough for a big machine. Right? right. Yeah, well, so this is why in my day job, trying to make ARM servers a thing, uh, and they will be, uh, I've really pushed for 64K as the minimum granule size, as they call it. Because I think if you're building a new architecture, it doesn't really make any sense. We'll talk a bit later about how that can even impact how your cache is organized. Uh, so, so we'll get there. I'm going to keep cranking because uh, I guess time is getting away from us. But. Um, Anyway, there's, there's some optimizations you can do in your TLBs. Uh, applications think they own the world. They don't. They, <laughs> the uh, application binary, the ELF image in Linux, or the PEcoff in Windows, or uh, for Mac O, is that the format they use on OS X? I'm not a Mac person. I think that's the format they use. Um, these application binaries provide hints as to where to load in virtual memory the application when it starts up. Uh, we map other things into the virtual address space. I mentioned before that the OS, until fairly recently, was mapped in the top half of every, address, of every virtual address space. In fact, in Linux, it was more than that. The entirety of RAM was mapped in every process uh, at the top of the virtual address space. Uh, the official things that we're providing, the official interfaces we're providing, include something in Linux called a virtual dynamic shared object. So uh, the kernel will actually provide certain data to every process, quite intentionally, uh, with the idea that, for example, if all you want to do is sit in a loop and read the current wall clock time, get time of day, it would be more efficient if I told you that without you doing a call into the OS every single time. So we have this page where we store uh, a reasonable approximation to the most recent wall clock time. And instead of doing the system call, we just read the data from that. So it's, it's much more efficient. So there's other things we can do uh, in, in, in virtual memory, uh, you know, kind of beyond what you might, you might already know. Um, 
Let's talk a bit more about caches. That screen keeps disappearing on me. Uh, so I, I kind of just want to make one, one point here. This is, this is about the cache organization uh, optimization piece we, we almost got onto just now. Um, when I touch a memory address, a virtual memory address, what I'm needing to do uh, is check if that's in my cache during the access. Uh, and what I might do is split how I, uh, how I perform that cache access. So I may perform part of the translation of my virtual memory to physical memory in parallel with the cache access. Um, this is actually where the page size piece comes in because if you've got a 4K page size in a machine, uh, for, for reasons you can read about later on, uh, this actually will limit uh, the size of your cache for your level one cache. So in a typical machine, uh, in a typical machine I will have these cache lines that contain, that can contain blocks of memory, can contain blocks of physical memory, copies of it. Um, I have protocols that will manage that coherently and try to keep that the same as, uh, keep a consistent view uh, between what the core sees and what is uh, in the actual RAM. Uh, and then I have different ways I can organize these caches. And there's the next slide here. I think I said it somewhere here. Yeah, so a common optimization is to use uh, VIPT caches. So virtually indexed, physically tagged, which is what this diagram here talks about. So I use the low order bits of a virtual address to start doing my cache lookup when I access an address. At the same time, I translate the other half, I do the actual TLB translation, to find the remaining piece that I need. So the first part of the lookup will tell me which uh, index to look in my cache, and then I will check every entry in that index against the translation that I get in parallel. Um, and that's just one example of optimizations that we do uh, in caches. It's one reason that uh, virtually indexed, physically tagged caches are very popular, especially at the level one uh, layer. That's all I want to point out there. Okay, so why is this interesting? Well, uh, caches can be used as what we call side channels. The whole point of a cache is uh, to provide a, a performance benefit, to provide a speed up, right? Uh, caches are, by their nature, shared resources between multiple processors, and they contain data that's shared between multiple different concurrently running programs. Um, is that necessary? Well, no. You can have a cache per process. You can. Yeah, you're, you're, so, so you're both right. <laughs> the kernel is common, depending on how we map memory. Uh, you, you also can have um, some cache partitioning, so people have different names for this in the industry. Uh, Intel calls it uh, CAT, cache allocation technology, uh, part of their resource director technology. Um, other companies have different things that they do. But what you can do is you can say, I'm going to partition my cache, and I'm going to separate it and just give this process this and this process this. That can help you to an extent uh, to mitigate some of the side channel attacks, not meltdown, but potentially other side channel attacks in the future. But what a side channel really means is um, because uh, when we designed architectures, when we designed memory systems, we didn't really pay enough attention to the time component, right? To the fact that we can observe how long <laughs> We can observe the passage of time, right? How long does a load take? How long does an operation take um, that hits in my cache or does not hit in my cache? Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. You, if, if you want, you can actually go online uh, on GitHub and you can look, I think it's IAIK is the project you want to look for. The folks at TU Graz who did some of the work on uh, these exploits, I'll come to you in a second. Uh, some of the folks that did the work on this, they actually published some really interesting uh, demo programs that you can run to measure uh, different uh, aspects of your cache. Um, but what you can do is you can literally measure how long does it take to access a particular memory location. And from that, you can infer 
Is it in my level one, level two, level three? Where in my cache is it, or is it not? Uh, it actually gets a bit more exciting. Uh, let me come to the, well, I'll come back to that. But, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll foreshadow. <laughs> uh, you can actually, on some, uh, on some processors, you can actually, uh, <laughs> you have an instruction uh, that will actually flush an entry from the cache that's unprivileged. Any application can do this. I can say on my Intel machine, I can say, uh, flush this memory location. Make sure it's not in my cache. And uh, you can actually time the amount of time it takes to call the flush instruction. And from that, you can infer, was it in the cache or not? Um, so the, the nice thing about that is you never even have to try to load something, right? So with the other attack, you have to at least try to you know, do a load, time it, do a load again, see if it was in the cache. With the flush, you don't even have to do that. It's much harder to detect. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's kind of how you, how you would do it. Uh, on most uh, contemporary processors, there's either an instruction to do this or there's other ways you can, you can achieve the same thing. But you, you, have a high, you have a very high precision timestamp counter, the TSC, on x86 machines. Uh, I can read it. I can do a memory access. <laughs> I can read it again. I look at the delta, right? I can see was that, uh, was, was that location cached. And we'll come back to why that's important in a moment. You had a question. Before I keep going, do you want me to? I think you're answering it. Uh, the question was, at what point did high resolution timestamps become part of the x86 architecture? It certainly didn't start out. Thank you. <laughs> it, 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 at least as long as we've had the problem that we're, we're, we're yeah. But how did you defend the system? There was the ability to disable it. And you said, we didn't pay enough attention. I was in D5, uh, right. D6. Right. We didn't pay enough attention to time. I always wanted you, the OS guys, to disable the bloody timestamps. <laughs> well, it so, never happened. So, so the funny thing is, right? So I'll take a tangent, because tangents are good. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the mitigation in Android, one of the mitigations. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. So there's the, 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 I wanted them to disable Two. Okay. Oh! <laughs> all right. All right, you guys. I'll I'll finish my story and we'll we'll come back to that. So, the the uh, the mitigation in Android, by the way, one of the things they said la in December was we'll just turn off access to high precision timers. We'll lie. We'll add these deltas. We'll deal with the statistical analysis part of it. We'll make it very very imprecise. You can still time how long things take. You can count cycles. There's a lot. You know, I, I've been pointing this out to them. It, it, this is great, guys. But there's so many ways you can still <laughs> you can still do this. So fundamentally. Uh, any time there, it, pun intended, I guess, any time there is a difference in the amount of time it takes to do something and you can observe it, you can infer very interesting things as a result. Um, so side channels are very exciting. They've been getting a lot of research uh, in the last few years, certainly. Uh, as I said, many instruction sets provide high resolution, cycle accurate timers. Uh, yes? Before you started talking about uh, the timestamp counter as a side channel. You gave a nice little overview of uh, the TLB. Yep. And my question is, I don't know the answer to this either, is, is that when Spectre, not when Spectre, when Meltdown uses, well, one of them, I can't remember which one it is, when they actually speculate on a, on a, on a memory address, yep. is it taking a TLB fault? Yes. Well, no, it's not. In fact, it has to already be in the TLB, and I have a slide on that, so we'll, 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 We'll answer it. That will not prefetch if it's going to take a TLB. Well. Correct, correct. We'll, we'll come. That's a very good question. I'm putting that on the stack as well because that is a. I have a specific point on that. That's that's good. Uh, you you uh, depending on the implementation, you have to have it in the TLB as well as the L1 cache. The the guys at TU Graz tell me no. And every time they tell me something, I'm inclined to listen to them. So, but for some of the designs I've seen, it certainly has to be both in the TLB and the level one. That's the only way I can make for, for meltdown. meltdown. Yes, and we'll come back to the. Well, let's 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 keep going. We'll come back to that. But you might clarify why knowing whether something is in the cache yep. is a value. Right. Right. Well, so so uh, I think for a lot of people in in. in building machines, it was, I, I, you guys paid attention, I'm not picking on any particular person here, but you know, you, you might think, well, it doesn't really matter, right? What we're gonna see in the next few slides is, uh, you know, why that is a key insight that, that, that really makes some of these attacks possible. So, so we, can, we can measure, 
cache behavior. We might have convenient instructions. They're very nice. Give me a CL flush. People say, well, why is CL flush there? Why can I flush stuff out of my cache? Well, the reality is I can also flush something from the cache by doing what's called a displacement flush. I can make another data structure that sits here. I happen to know where it's going to sit in my cache when I access it, and so I don't even need an instruction. I can still force things to evict from my cache. There's, there's nowhere to hide from, from this. Yeah, exactly. And I've got a Rohammer uh, piece as well, so this is cool. All right, let's keep going. Uh, some processors also provide, we touched on prefetching, uh, the means to prefetch data that will be needed soon, uh, usually through hint instructions. They might be, uh, we don't have to go too much into NOPS space stuff, but these instructions may or may not do something, right? They, they're, they're hints. I may use this data sometime soon. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can time prefetches as well. Uh, and uh, this actually became a problem in Linux a number of years ago because uh, it would uh, insert a prefetch for uh, pointers it was, about, it was likely to use soon. And it was discovered that every time there was a null pointer, uh, that prefetch would take too long. And so Linux removed the use of uh, this prefetch precisely because you could actually infer the amount of time for a pointer access. So it's very interesting that uh, we, what we've seen over the last few years. Uh, so here's some ex examples of how you would uh, use prefetches. Let's keep going. I want to go to branch uh, prediction. Uh, so uh, here's a slide. I think you guys probably uh, don't need it. Uh, you know, frequently we have program control flow instructions uh, where we need to change the flow of execution based on some condition, right? Uh, whenever we do this, we're going to have a either inconsequential or significant hit to our pipeline, depending on uh, the outcome, right? Um, if we'll talk a bit, bit more in a moment about speculation, but if I go down a branch, if I go down a path of code execution and it's the wrong path, uh, going back the right way, uh, you know, the Chinese proverb is uh, uh, no matter how far down the wrong path you've gone, turn back, right? But that may be expensive, so. Um, there is some benefit in predicting uh, which way code is going to go. Uh, and I'll talk about two kinds of branch here. Conditional branches, which is really your classic if statement. If this value, uh, then uh, do this, otherwise do that. Uh, that would be a, a, a conditional. Um, some instruction sets let you encode, actually, the likely outcome from branches. Most x86 processors ignore those now because actually it's better for the hardware to figure it out. Um, but you, you, you will see in uh, OS software things like if likely this, uh, well, that will do nothing on most processors now, but it, it used to do things. Um, somewhere here, I, yeah, okay. Okay, so I'll touch on speculation. I'll come back to branch prediction a bit more. So speculation is an extension of, um, I'm trying to cram a lot here into an hour. Uh, speculation is an extension of out-of-order machines, right? So, so speculation is basically layering on the out-of-order mechanics that I have in my machine. Uh, and it's saying that if I uh, reasonably believe that I'm going to execute a particular path of code, follow a branch, uh, then uh, let's abuse the fact that we have all this infrastructure to run programs further ahead. Uh, let's uh, start tagging entries in my reorder buffer. This is before the instruction has retired. This is before it's become architecturally visible. Let's tag them as speculative. Let's say, I'm not sure if that actually is the way the program's gonna go, but let's keep running it ahead. Uh, let's tag these instructions as being speculative in nature. Uh, the key things here are don't update, don't update the architectural state. Don't make it visible. Apparently, that's the plan. It didn't quite work that way, but that was the idea. Um, and stores to memory will be uh, filed away in my uh, internal structures. They won't actually make it out to memory until that instruction uh, retires. Um, exceptions caused by my uh, code that's running speculatively uh, will not be raised until retirement, until the instruction actually becomes uh, committed. Uh, then um, I can't report something that may not happen. Right? You try to load something, 
but you didn't actually because I did it speculatively. I can't blame you for that because I don't know if that's the thing I, you actually want to do, right? So I have to tag that also in my reorder buffer and say um, that I have an exception. If this becomes the path that I'm really going to take, then I may have to deal with that. Well, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the piece we're going to come to. Uh, and then some people made a, a mistake with that. Uh, <laughs> that will, yeah. Most companies think of it as speculation comes first on in-order processors, and out-of-order gets added later. Oh, interesting. Although, interestingly, when you think, talk about Tom Sulu, I think what you said is historically accurate. Yeah. I think out-of-order came first. Yeah. Not 100% certain about that. Yeah, I think it did because of how he did the distributed yeah. reservation. But every company was evolving, and many microcontrollers are in order now and have ad speculation. Right, right, absolutely. Why and then run ahead as well. Which those simple in order machines are immune. Yeah, well, it, it, I don't think they, by the way, I don't think they are. Uh, yeah. A lot of them are vulnerable as well, yes. But, yes. but out of order makes it worse. Yes, right. That's kind of one of the things I'm, I'm trying to, to say here. Uh, okay, so. Branch prediction, let's come back to that. So if, if, I'm, if I'm implementing a prediction of branches, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a particular branch, and I'm going to say, uh, let, me, let me speculate that it's going to go this way. right? So if that's true, then I start tagging the instructions as speculative. I follow down the path, um, and hopefully all things are good. Uh, if it's not, the way the code actually ends up going, right? So, so I'm, I've got this condition. I'm waiting for the branch to resolve. I'm waiting for the condition to, to find out if this branch is going to be the way I go. Uh, if it was incorrect, then I'll have to throw away everything I did. Um, I'll have to fl uh, return my state. There's some optimizations for how to do that, but I'll have to return my state to where it was, and I'll have to go down the correct branch. And what you hope is that there's a performance hit from doing this, although it's small, uh, and you, uh, this is a black box, so in theory it's not visible to anybody else. Uh, we'll come on to how that's not necessarily true. Um, I've got a couple of slides here. I might skip in the interest of time about conditional and indirect branches, but you know these are examples of conditional branches. Uh, for example, you could have a loop, um, load a value into a register, uh, you know, run through a loop, uh, you compare the condition every time, and you may jump backwards uh, to, uh, to, to repeat the loop. Well, someone's going to point this out, but actually, uh, uh, you know, common, common processors have optimizations, so you don't actually have to deal with loops in, in reality. Um, there's a lot of correlation between branches in programs, right? So one of the insights that people designing processors found is that um, if you look at history, you can guess which way you're going to go in the future, right? You can say, the last few times I executed this, well, this looks a lot like a loop. And as, as, you'll, as you'll see later, you know, some processors will just have a loop predictor, and they will say, well, this is obviously a loop. I'm not even going to bother with, with the standard hardware for that. But you'll look at a branch, and you'll say, the last 100 times I executed this, I went that way, right? There's a high chance I'm going to do the same thing next time. So we have these predictors. Uh, which will tag the history of a particular uh, path of execution, a particular way a branch went, and they will try to infer where it is going to go the next time. Um, they can be very complicated in their design. So, uh, you know, a good predictor could be up to 99% accurate, and it may use both local branch information as well as global branch information. So, in other words, there's a number of uh, pieces of research that suggest that branches don't behave in isolation. This intuitively makes sense. If I have a bunch of conditions, one after the other, they are dependent uh, <laughs> on that chain. So I may tag, I may keep track of the overall set of branches. Uh, in, in this uh, hardware structure, the branch predictor hardware, um, what I also want to do is I want to optimize it. I want to keep track of which way branches went, but I want to save uh, resources. I want to save uh, using huge amounts of RAM on the processor. So I may not use the full address of, an, of a branch in my branch prediction hardware. So I'm going to keep the history of branches, but I'm going to either hash that uh, branch address 
or I'm going to use just part of the branch address and keeping track of history. Um, this is a key insight to why, why Spectre happens that we'll get to in a minute. Yes? <laughs> that's, what, that's what the code is. It's, it's virtual memory when the program's running. So you, you can, oh, you're right. You can, that's true enough, you can, you can tag on a physical address. I'm just talking about one kind of implementation. It's true enough. You can actually do... Physical and virtual. Well, well, we, we should we should take this after because because um, I, I I certainly have some some things I can't talk about here <laughs> that, that relate to that. Um, but but you're right. People do sometimes use physical addresses. Um, you can still have problems for that reason, and also because frankly I can write code that uh, you know I, I I can it's pretty difficult to do, but I can arrange for the same physical address to get used in two different places. It's possible. Um, but we, maybe we'll come back to that in the in the Q and A session. Um, I want to point out, anyone who's not sort of studied branch predictors, go and read, uh, read the slides after. You'll see uh, G-Share and some of these common designs that are used in, in branch prediction hardware. Uh, we want to optimize it, so we might uh, not use the full address. We also do indirect branch prediction. So indirect prediction is when I follow uh, a function pointer uh, into, a, into a, a, a virtual method, something like this. Um, I don't know where I'm going to go ahead of time. It's not just a conditional branch. It could be a branch to anywhere. There's also some fairly fancy hardware um, that can guess ahead of time uh, where indirect branches are going to go. They turn out to be, you know, in, in the Spectre literature, they talk a lot about indirect branches, but actually direct branches can also be a problem. Um, but we'll find out more in a minute about why indirect branches are a particular uh, source of, 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 of a problem when you can abuse them. And that's because indirect branches could really jump to anywhere, right? I'm foreshadowing a bit, but I want you to think that there's different kinds of branches, different kinds of predictors. The average microprocessor will have many, many different predictors, and they may all have to uh, come to a consensus. Uh, there may be an, uh, another meta predictor that decides which, which one's the correct one to use. Okay, let's keep going. I think I'm going to let you guys read that later on. So let's, I think we've covered enough of the background. So let's go into Meltdown and Spectre now um, so we get time to get to questions. So, uh, so these vulnerabilities, and there's CVE numbers are there, uh, these are branded vulnerabilities that were discovered in common industry-wide um, optimizations of the techniques I just described, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with uh, you know, branch prediction or speculation or out of order machines, they're all good ideas. The problem is that some implementations have been found to be vulnerable uh, to side channel analysis. And the media is very keen to say that it's the end of the world. You know, the media is very keen to say lots of things and that usually happens when you have a branded vulnerability that comes with a cute logo, right? <laughs> we, 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 we knew but by the way, so I, I knew it was the guys at, at, at uh, TU Graz working on this because uh, for, for, for reasons. And um, uh, so I actually uh, sent them an email a few weeks ago and I said, you know guys, when you register internet domains, um, don't use your own name and your institution because if I'm watching you since sometime before your public disclosure and I'm looking at everything you register, I might see when you register these cute domains. So they've actually changed the registrations and removed their names from it now. But I did enjoy doing a side channel analysis. Uh, did the name say meltdown microarchitecture vulnerability? No, no, no. We knew what was coming. We, we, we just, we, yeah, we were able to infer the, the name before, they, before they, they launched it. That's, that's a cute side story for you. Uh, so they came with cute names and logos, which always is worrying. Um, they exploit these features, but we don't have to panic and throw out all of our toys, right? We don't have to get rid of them. We just have to deal with these. Uh, if you are on a Linux or Windows machine, uh, if you're running a very recent Linux kernel, you could run that command, and you would see we now have a fun directory filled with CPU vulnerabilities because we think there might be more in the future. And so now there's a handy dandy way to find what is your chip vulnerable to today, right? Uh, and what are we doing to fix it? 
Um, so, so, so maybe, maybe look that up later on. And it will also tell you which mitigations are being used on your hardware. Uh, if you're on Windows, there's things you can do. If you're on a Mac, I, I have no idea. I think you can do something. Uh, so let's talk through the, the, the Spectre and Meltdown variants. So uh, Spectre variant one, uh, we just knew these, by the way, as variants one, two, and three for a long time, right? They got the cute names later. We were guessing what they would be, but we only ever uh, knew of the three main variants. Um, so yeah, the, both Spectre V1, 2, and to an extent Meltdown, they, they rely on particular code sequences, right? As I said, if, if to, to, to your question about, uh, you know, why is it important if you can tell what's in the cache? Um, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll jump to the, the, the Meltdown piece and we'll come back to Spectre. Maybe that will help, actually. Um, let's do Meltdown first. We'll come back to Spectre. So, so, so Meltdown, uh, effectively, if you are a literal implementation of Thomas Zulo, if you are literally uh, implementing it sort of by the book and you haven't read uh, Appendix B of Computer Architecture, page 37, or, or around there, where it talks about this um, and how not to do it, uh, then uh, you, may, uh, you may handle any exceptions that arise at instruction retirement. Uh, so that's the first piece. Second piece is you may do your permission checks in parallel with actually performing any kind of load. That's the second piece. That's the other piece that you need. Um, and then if you do that, a race condition could exist between uh, what you, 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 did, you did this load. You're not allowed to do it, but I did it for you anyway. I tagged it. So if that instruction ever actually retires, then we're good. I'm going to take an exception, and the OS is going to slap you and say, don't do that, and it's going to kill your program. But in that window there, there is a period of time where that load has happened. And future instructions might be able to do something with it. So what could they do? Well, here's an example. This is from my own reproducer. So I spent um, tail end of last year, uh, I, I didn't sleep much for the last few months. Uh, and my, my Fitbit knows it. It said your heart rate's 20% higher than, than, yeah, I know. Uh, so uh, we've been sort of neck deep in mitigations for a long time here. Um, what, what uh, so, so my reproducer here is very, very ugly, but what it does is basically say, look, I'm going to try to access a pointer I shouldn't be able to access. I'm then going to take the value that I read that I can't read, but I can because I'm not going to handle that right now. Uh, and I'm going to do some mask. I'm going to do something with that value. And I'm then going to access another piece of data based on the value of the data that I wanted to read, right? The actual content of the privileged data that I wanted to read, right? And if I do it this way, there are better ways to do it. That's the way I did it. Um, I can say, I'd like to read this single bit from some privileged data that I don't have access to, right? Um, I'll load the value. I'll figure out which bit I want. I'll mask it off. Is it a one? Is it a zero? If it's one, I access one memory location. If it's a, if it's a zero, I access the other memory location. Then I have some code that sits there in its own sweet time, measuring how long it took to read from one location or the other. And since I pre-flush those ahead of time, I know that neither of them is in my cache. I can then measure to see which of those two uh, is in my cache, and I can see what the speculative load was. If I rinse and repeat this many, many times, uh, then I can dump memory effectively. And I can dump pretty much you know, whatever I want. Now, there are some conditions, as we talked about, that, that, that may or may not have to be present. So I found on some unnamed architectures, because it's not just, there's lots of architectures impacted here. On some implementations uh, of speculation, it may be not as aggressive. You may have to have the data in the L1 decache. Um, you may have to have a TLB for that address already. That's not a given, actually. Um, but, but those conditions may be required. Um, I think, yeah, so, you know, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm separating the, the 
privilege check from the actual data access. As a consequence, I can infer uh, what values are there. And by the way, I do the accesses in, uh, in, in, oh, I didn't put it in there. I do the accesses in reverse order because the hardware does lots of other things underneath. It, it has a thing called uh, prefetching where uh, it'll, it'll say, well, you access this location, you're probably going to access the next cache line very soon, so I actually do them in reverse to try to fool it. To, 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 it probably they, they're smart anyway and figure that out as well. But um, I'm able to read memory very slowly with my implementation. The one that you'll see publicly from the researchers, I think, is, is much more performant, but they both achieve the same thing. Uh, let's go to the how you mitigate meltdown. Ten levels of, uh, of abstraction ahead of where you were. Like, like what is bit, for example? It's not oh, okay. Well, I, I would, yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good point. Um, well, I can try to I can try to unwind that a little bit. So, you know, I've got this value I want to read, right? I've got this privileged value I want to read, and you know, it's it, it consists of bits. It consists of say thirty two bits of data, right? What I can do is I can read one sub bit, one bit of that data at a time in, this, in, in, in my particular uh, attack. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the, the, the value that I'm not entitled to access, I'm going to take each little bit of that value and I'm going to individually work out what the value of that bit was. And I'm gonna do it by um, well, masking it off by, by taking only the bit I want, and based on that single bit, I'm going to perform a second memory access, which I'm gonna time, okay? And then in my, in my implementation, um, I reconstruct all 32 bits of every single uh, piece of memory I want to read um, by repeating this many, many times. There are more efficient implementations that exist that actually uh, read memory much faster than, than, than this example. And they do a shit in the, the implementations is, is much faster, right? This was, this was me uh, in, in December frantically trying to figure out how the heck does this work and not having any of the public, uh, you know, information. So. Would have the way slow time phase if where stuff which measures where actual uh, is uh, where 100 or 200 is in cache. I think I have it somewhere. I showed it earlier. That's very true. Don't put the BTS in the laptop. No, you need to measure anywhere. Okay, yeah. so you need to measure to know which one is in cache. Okay. So we need to measure every time of the Measurement might be in a different thread. Andy, let's try to keep oh, it. Yeah, yeah I think we have two more minutes. I think we're I think we're we're running low on time. That's why I'm trying to keep keep going here. So okay, I'm gonna talk about Spectre, uh, variant one and variant two. I'm sorry? Okay, sorry, yeah, mitigation. Okay. Okay, so uh, mitigating, mitigating meltdown. Okay, so mitigating meltdown, um, you know, as I said, the, there, are, there are certain preconditions required to exploit meltdown. Um, you have to have, you have to have the condition in which uh, the data is accessible to the code that may run speculatively. Um, if you can remove the environment from which speculating code can actually perform that load, then you can prevent, you know, you're not fixing it, you're not fixing the silicon, but you're mitigating it. You're making that, that those circumstances uh, impossible. And so one of the primary mitigations that we use that's expensive is we change how we set up the operating system page tables and we split them. So instead of having a page table for every application that's shared with the kernel, that, that's shared with the operating system, what I do now is I have for every program, I have one set of page tables for the program and one set of page tables for the operating system, for the kernel. Every time I go into the operating system to do something, I switch the page tables. So they're never, it's never the case that I have the same virtual memory environment active I, I, it's never the case that I would have kernel addresses visible uh, from, the, from the application's address space. I double up my page tables, and I take this expensive hit every time I go into or out of my kernel. Uh, 
I have to do a switch. Yes. Well, I mentioned earlier there's an optimization, PCIDs and ACIDs. So I might not have to flush all of them. That's why on uh, x86, for example, uh, processors with the PCID feature are going to become much more interesting now because it's much more performant to implement it when you have access to, uh, to these features. Have any kernel memory mapped in user space <coughs> that's marked inaccessible. Correct. So why is this just flushing the TLD sufficient? Why do you have to remap it? Because uh, in we had this whole debate. I mean, I think I'll I think I'll save that question for 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 later because I know we're running low on time. Yeah, we 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 uh, we should we should keep going because I want to I want to cover the. Spectre uh, variant one and two, if I can, in the time we have. So, <laughs> so let's talk about Spectre variant one. Spectre variant one is a bounce check bypass. Uh, in in effect, what I do is I say, I may I may have some uh, piece of data, some some information passed from one context to another. So, for example, from uh, application into the OS kernel, to the operating system. And normally what I would do is I would perform a bounce check from that to sanitize it and say, uh, you know, the user, the untrusted user gave me some value. I should check if it lies within uh, the defined range. However, the program may continue to execute speculatively beyond that bounce check. Meaning that if I were to find, and the code here, well, don't worry too much about this exact code because it's, pretty much the same kinds of code that you'll see for the meltdown attack. The point is, if I can find a piece of code in, that's already present in, in the operating system, that already accesses some, that already does this kind of uh, load sequence we talked about just now. So I have to find a gadget. I have to find some piece of code. We call them, we call them gadgets. I have to find some piece of code in the kernel that's going to do what I want. It has to be there. If, I, if, I don't, if it's not there, I can't do this. But in the case of variant one of Spectre, if I can find some little gadget where I give you some unsanitized value and you're going to keep speculating and you do some other load that impacts the cache, I might, under very obscure circumstances, possibly be able to read something. And reproducing this is a huge problem. I mean, it's very, very complex, very, very difficult. Uh, it's, it's been done kind of in the abstract like one time. Right? That's enough to put it in a paper and, and be a huge problem, but, but actually creating Spectre variant 1 attacks is very difficult. Right? Um, we, can, we can mitigate Spectre uh, by uh, inserting what we call uh, context serializing instructions. So we can say, after some bounds check condition, I can put a special instruction that normally exists in, in most architectures that's going to prevent the speculation beyond there. It's expensive, but there are ways I can do it. And the way I would do it is that. <laughs> um, and in, in the case of x86, that's called LFence. It, it varies by architecture. But the only way to really mitigate this, by the way, is to go through my, my software and actually change it. Right? There are some tools out there that can go through, and some compilers are being modified to go and insert these sequences. But right now, the mitigation is go and identify where these offending code paths are. And we have source and binary scanners to do this. It's not easy. Uh, go find where these are and go insert the right serializing instructions in, in just the right places. Uh, it's, 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 it's painful. The side channel, this, this doesn't have a specific side channel. What you're doing here is you're, you're looking you have to find a piece of code that already does something that you want it to do speculatively. So uh, if you look at the previous example we used with Meltdown, performing, a, performing an access that you shouldn't be able to do and then using that value to do something else, you have to have a piece of code already present uh, th that, that is vulnerable by, 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 doing, uh, by having a sequence of vulnerable instructions. So it doesn't just exist in, 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 in the wild. You have to have a specific set of code uh, that's in a more privileged application that you can exploit using this attack. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same common theme. Yeah, it's the same common theme. It's all cache timing. 
It's all the same. It's all the same attack. It's 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 variations. As I mean, as, as I, that's why they called it variants, right? So. Normal yes. If you can find the gadget that does what you want to do, you can read any piece of memory you want. That 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 gadget. In theory, can have if you can find one, and and uh, let, let's keep going because I want to I want to finish the video piece, and then we'll get into the open discussion. So um, for for variant two, um, what I can do, as I mentioned earlier, branch predictor uh, branch predictors may not fully disambiguate between different branches. I may have a branch predictor. Uh, in which two different applications running in two different virtual memory address spaces could have branches at the same virtual addresses uh, that the branch predictor can't really tell apart. Right? So what I can do in Spectre Variant 2 uh, is I can write a very crafty application which, when it runs, is going to train the branch predictor to think that branches in, in the future are going to go a particular direction. And in the case of indirect branches, where it could be an offset, it could be guessing a, a, an offset, what I can do is I can train the branch predictor to speculatively jump to some offset that I have control over. If that offset is a gadget, the same as variant one, um, then what I can do is I can have even more control. Now, I don't have to look for a specific uh, entry point into my privileged code. I can now look for any code sequence anywhere. It doesn't have to be beginning of a function, end of a function, anywhere. I can look for any place where I see the instructions I want to exploit, and I can have an application which will train my branch predictor so that when I, ne when I next run my kernel code or my OS code, uh, it thinks a particular branch is going to go uh, is, going to, is, going to, is going to result in a piece of gadget code running. Now, creating the environment for Spectre Variant 2 is even harder than Spectre Variant 1. And if you read the paper that the Google guys published, they were able to do this like one time. Uh, and it took, you know, what was it, two hours of setup time and a very special environment, very contrived uh, system that they had full control over. And, and so, you know, the reality is this is very, very difficult to exploit at this moment in time. If it sounds difficult, it is very, very difficult to exploit this. So, 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 so you can do both. You can have a, you can have a, an exploit across hyperthreads if you've got a threaded core. There's also a very strong attack path there, and I'll, I'll actually touch on that in a moment, but that is also uh, uh, a significant problem as well if you're using hyperthreading. I want to keep going because I know we're running low on time, and, and we can take this to an open discussion. Um, what we did initially to mitigate variant 2, we used a uh, big hammer initially. So the big hammer approach was simply to uh, turn off the branch predictor. <laughs> Uh, when we were going from one state into another that was uh, less, uh, that was more privileged. Did you try to keep the performance yes, that's what we do. So, so in fact, uh, okay, I'm going to let you read about the millicode stuff later. But on x86, what we did was we implemented something called IBRS, indirect branch restrict speculation. And so, on entry into the kernel, we we touch this magic uh, control bit. This, this, this model specific register, and we turn off uh, indirect branch speculation um, while the kernel is running. When we come back out of the kernel, we come back to the application, we turn it back on again. Um, that's expensive because we don't get the benefit of, branch, of, of the branch predictor. Um, and even more than that, we, um, <laughs> we, we, we have the cost of actually doing that operation. That, oper that operation is not inexpensive, right? Yes. Actually, I thought about the moment I switch on off because this operation may clear. But it may clear. So, so okay. So we have another uh, another interface we added called IBPB, which flushes the branch predictor state. So what we do is we have exactly that. We have a separate instruction, and they could imp they could be implemented the same, right? There's different ways you can implement it, but but the second piece we do actually will flush the branch predictor state. And we do that when we switch from one process to another. So we turn off, we turn off the branch predictor briefly when we're going to go into a more privileged state. 
and we whack the contents when we are uh, switching from one process to another. I'm going to get to, I think I'll touch on repolines, and then I think we can kind of take the rest to an open discussion. So there is something that uh, Google invented uh, called repolines. You can read more about it later on. But what they do is they turn um, indirect branches into uh, fake function returns. So they say, you know, uh, uh, the, the old doctor joke, right? If it hurts to do this, then don't do it. OK, so uh, if, it, if you can abuse indirect function calls uh, to, uh, 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 with, with a malicious poisoning of your branch predictor, replace every indirect function call with a different piece of code that doesn't use, uh, that doesn't rely on the same hardware. And what, what, what Google came up with was this construct, and I'll let you guys read the, the link to the, the paper. Um, uh, I, I won't, there's not time to go through the, the code here, but uh, what, what Google came up with is this idea that effectively I, uh, I, <laughs> I hack the, the, the uh, program state so that we think we're returning from a function. When we return from that function, what we're actually going to do is we're going to call the thing we wanted to call. And they, they set this up so that you'll, you'll see there, those of you guys who are sort of assembly folks, you'll see that it says capture specs. What they do is they, they literally set up the speculation so that it will, it will think it's in an infinite loop, uh, calling a pause instruction, branching to itself in an infinite loop if it speculates. It's a cute hack. The Google guys are really great coming up with that. And um, as a result, what we can do for, uh, for spec through variant two is we can modify our compilers uh, to emit this code sequence uh, instead of turning off our branch predictor. And that brings back a lot of the performance that we, we lose by, by using the, uh, the control interfaces. Uh, I'm going to keep going past. I think we're almost done with the kind of main content. There is a variant uh, of melt. There is another variant called variant 3A, which lets you read registers you're not supposed to access. Um, I'll let you guys kind of go through that. Final a prepared slide. Uh, Related research, um, so you know these these exploits don't exist in isolation. Uh, there's another set of attacks that were done previously called Rowhammer, right? Which uh, someone mentioned earlier. Uh, th that's another example of a hardware-specific attack. There's another, uh, yet another uh, interesting one I've seen uh, called Magic, <laughs> which uh, uh, they were able to come up with particular sequences of. Um, instructions which, when you executed them on a particular OpenSpark processor, could artificially age it, uh, which is pretty crazy, actually. Um, but they were able to do it. And they were able to reduce performance by 10% in a matter of weeks by running carefully crafted instruction sequences. So the, the, the bottom line is uh, you know, Meltdown and Spectre are kind of interesting. right? They're the flavor of the month right now. We're dealing with those. But there are tons of other. Uh, uh, pieces of related research going on, and, and novel attacks are being found all the time. <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, that one's just an ACM paper, and uh, you know, no one gave it a cute logo, right? So, so, I mean, I'm I'm very serious, right? That's the last point I, I, I sort of I'll make is, you know, yeah, if 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 you come up with an attack, if you give it a cute name and a logo, you're going to be on the New York Times front page. Uh, whether or not that is, uh, you know, you know, Spectre variant two, frankly, you know, very very hard to exploit. Meltdown much easier to exploit. You'll see all the reproducers show Meltdown first because that's the easy one to get the media attention. Um, so with that, I am out of time for my slides, and I want to open it up and just take questions. And uh, thank you, thank you for the video.